Hey folks, welcome to the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest. I'm coming to you today with a very special episode with Trudy Goodman. Trudy is a meditation teacher. She has a background in psychotherapy as well. She's a deep Buddhist and she's got a lot to share. I was just really happy to be able to talk to her. I ran into her at the Ram Dass retreat in Maui. And she and her partner, Jack Cornfield have been involved with those retreats in Ram Dass for many, many years. But it was the first time that we had actually crossed paths. And we connected, and I thought it would be great to get her on the podcast because, as usual, I often feel that the podcast is a great way to get to know people better. Sort of like I can have conversations and have sort of the excuse to ask questions that I might be embarrassed to ask. Were I just chit-chatting? And I get to share it with you as well. So that's what we're going to do. And I think you'll enjoy it very much. I'm heading to Australia, as I've been talking about. It's coming right up. It's about a week away. Today's the January, late January. Well, it's the 26th today. But when this comes out, it should be the 29th or so. And we'll take off for Australia on February 4th. Somehow when we leave, we arrive like on the third day on February 7th. It's one of those weird things. Or maybe it's the six. I don't know. It's a long time. It's a long travel. And the tour commences officially uh, in mid-February. Starts on February 15th. It'll be all around Sydney, Manly, Neutral Bay, Byron Bay. I'm sorry. It'll be uh, Bondi. Is it Bondi at Bondi, right? I'm going to get all these. I'm going to learn, and then I'm going to come back and feel like I was a big idiot. February 14th in Bondi. (laughs) Bondi. I don't know. I'm going to say Bondi, but I've heard uh, one of my Australian friends say Bondi, Bondi Beach. Manly, Neutral Bay. Then we go down to Byron Bay, Dunan. I think Dunan's sold out, but they just added a couple more tickets. Brisbane. Is that a Brisbane? Brisbane. Fitzroy, Adelaide. And that's going to wrap it up there, I think, around February 22nd. So grab a ticket in advance if you can, if you want to come. And thank you for those of you who are helping spread the word. Just You know, invite a friend. It's my first time down there, and I I really just want to feel like I'm part of the family, this global family that I know is down there too. So I'm just so excited to meet the community and do what I can to offer some some space down there for everything that's going on. Uh, So that's coming up real soon, and my mind is there. Otherwise, I've just been working on the studio here and, and getting things ready, doing a lot of rehearsal. I'm still uh, praying to the computer gods. I'm doing my daily worship with uh, the God of Macintosh, working a big shout out to my friend Steve-O and uh, Eddie over at 1201 in Portland. These are some of my guys who know a lot more than I do about how these black boxes work, or I should say space gray boxes. I'm basically continuing to try, you know, you have to try different things. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure out a few glitches. I'm saying that in a very fun way because it can be very stressful. And so by me keeping light about it, it's a way of not falling into the void where I'm uh, doing certain obsessive compulsive things to try to not have weird things happen while I'm performing. No, no, but it's been good. It's actually a good excuse because it keeps me rehearsing for a long time. And I'm excited because I've been doing some things with the Ram Dass material live that is I'm sort of trying to stretch my limits and make it even more and more live, like more fluid and malleable and reinvented on the spot so that it can be, uh, well, just that, responsive and live. And I can do what I've always liked to do in a ceremony space, which is improvise completely in the, inside uh, the performance space. I've never really seen true, you know, ceremony, psilocybin ceremonies as performances, but this is a hybridization. The East Forest ceremony is a mixture of concert and ceremony and ritual. So want to bring some of those elements in, keep it as live and fluid and dynamic as we possibly can. Uh, Thank you. If you can, just before we get into this interview, if you could give this podcast five stars, if you're on the Apple podcast, just scroll down there. It's real easy. It takes about two seconds. Those ratings make a big difference. So when I reach out to people like Trudy and all the other guests that I have coming on and want to reach out to in the future, uh, it helps them sort of evaluate the legitimacy of the podcast. Not everyone has the time to really dive in, but if you can do that, that'd be great. You don't even have to leave a written comment. Those are awesome. Those certainly help, but if that's too much, just clicking on the five stars makes a big difference and sharing it online, all that kind of stuff. 
You can say hello at info at eastforest.org. Ask any questions. Leave your rants at the door. Uh, if you you know if you have anyone you might want to suggest for the podcast, I'm always all ears. But for now, let's get into this amazing conversation with Trudy Goodman. So Trudy, thank you so much for joining us and giving us some time. It was a total pleasure getting to cross paths in Maui. And I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've, you were going there for a long time. You've known or knew Ram Dass for a very long time. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and done those retreats for years together with Jack. Mm. But, and it's funny because years ago, Ram Dass actually invited me to teach one with him before I really knew him well at all. Uh, and then I didn't go. <laughs> oh, my. I can't believe it now. I know. <laughs> I know. But, you know, I didn't know Ram Dass back in the early days when um, Jack did. And I wasn't, to be honest, drawn to him when I was young. And it was really later in life after his stroke that I got more interested in him. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What yeah. what was that shift that that what was the attractor after the stroke? Well, two things. First, the first attractor was that after the stroke, he was really different. He was very humble. He was um, mm. he had to work with severe limitation, and it was inspiring to see how he did that and how he transcended that and how he maintained the ability to do what he loved, but in different ways. That was really inspiring to me. Right, and, and then. Also, Jack, um, when Jack and I got together and started hanging out, we would go to Maui and see him and stay at his house. And, you know, it was just a whole different way of getting to know him. And I fell in love with him, absolutely, as mm. everybody does. Yes. Yeah, my my journey with Ram Dass, as far as meeting him, wasn't until 2018. Uh, but before oh, that... Really? He, yeah. 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 Not too long ago is when I went over there to do the actual recording with him. And before that, my relationship was just through his talks and his books. And sure, sure. Um, yet it was such a profound impact he had on my life in just in these last two years. Um, everything, obviously, from just creating something like that together and, and the way it's moved through my life and others. But he gave me a, a, a spiritual name when I was there. I asked for one. And he gave me one, and that's I didn't expect that when I went there. And it also, by in kind of taking that on, it, it's changed my life so much. You know, like just day to day. I want to. Uh, I want to find out how it's changed your life. <laughs> it's not a long time, but of course, it's not about time. Transformation yeah. is not about time. Well, I'll, I'll tell you briefly. I mean, it's it's pretty simple. Like uh, I I'd heard from someone named Vishnu Das that you might have known, a younger guy there. Yeah, I do. Yeah, who moved away? But I was hanging out with him, and he said, "You know, you can get a, you can ask for a name." He just kind of said that when we were hanging out, and I thought, "Oh well, I guess if I'm going to, this would be my time." And we had finished recording on the second day, and I was wrapping up, and I thought, "I think this is my chance." So I, I said, "Hey, Ramdas," you know, I, I was sort of stammering, and I heard you could, yeah, I gave all these conditions like, well, if, if you feel like it or if, you know, I don't, but you don't have to, and it doesn't have to be a good name, but yeah, whatever. I heard some people have said, anyway, I asked and he's just that sitting there. Laugh. Yeah. He's soaking it in. You're just trying, you're trying to You're be like, right. what are you, what are you right. asking? And then he didn't say anything and he's just sort of looking at me. And so I let it go. And I think five or 10 minutes passed and I was going through my whole process that was much faster than his, where I had in my mind thought he either didn't hear me or he doesn't think I need one and he's not going to give me one. I need to let it go. Yada, yada, Lots yada. of thinking, 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 thinking. Yes. Right. I went through the whole thing and I finally <laughs> gave it up. I'm like, I have a name. I don't need another name. What was I, <laughs> stupid person? And he's staring out the ocean as I'm cleaning up and with his beads and deep in thought. And I thought he was actually just on another thing, you know, moving on. And all of a sudden, he just says, Krishna. 
And I didn't actually follow even, I had moved on. I didn't follow what he was saying. I said, <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's what I said. I said, what are you talking about? I said, the, I heard about? someone singing Kirtan. I was like, is a song down the hall? And he says, oh, yeah, Krishna. And I still didn't get it. And he said it, I, I, I still was just looking at him. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't follow you, man. And he said it again. And then uh, my partner was there and she's like, that's your name. And I said, oh my God, oh my God. And then I said, I said, is it, I said, because I was nervous. I thought, well, I don't want to walk out of here. And maybe you, you know, the aphasia, maybe there's a DOS there or something. And for the rest of my life, I'll only have half of it. And I said, so is it just Krishna? And for some reason, I said, like, like share, like sting, just one word. And he laughs. He just thought this was so funny. And he says for the fourth time, as loud as he can, Krishna. And then I start crying and I'm kissing his Aww. hand. And, and then he named Aww. my partner Radha. And we uh, were just in this bliss bomb. And so what's amazing about it, Trudy, is that ever since then, you know, one word. Now when someone says that to me, it's not much to them. But it's sort of a call to arms to me spiritually in the moment to say, oh, sure. wait a minute. Sure. How can I be a, a new person in this moment versus all the baggage I've had all my life? Well, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> yeah, thanks yeah. for listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but for yourself, um, yeah. did you ever feel desire for us in all these years that you've had been, uh, the Buddhist meditation and your own? Like, do they do things like that, like different names? Yes, or spiritual they names? do. They do. Mm -hmm. um, they give you Dharma names. Um, but my first teacher was a Korean Zen master named Desan Sanim, and he gave me the name um, Desan in Korean, which means great nature. Mm. And I love that name because I've always loved nature and mm -hmm. felt spiritually supported and connected in nature. And so that felt like the right name. And then I became a teacher in his tradition and he gave me another name. And then anyway, I never used any of the names that I've gotten and I never requested a name from Ram Dass. Uh, I just don't know. I think because I was so immersed in my practice from those early days, I already got one name. I didn't feel like I had to accumulate <laughs> right. spiritual right. names. Right, 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 right. In fact, I would yeah. be self-conscious about that. It would make me seem like this, you know, sort of puddle jumper from Zen to uh, <laughs> Theravada to Hinduism to, you know, Advaita to, yeah. So I haven't, I just, and I just kind of, my given name, Trudy, is not a very usual name in the States. It's pretty common mm -hmm. in Germany, but but also my my parents loved me. And so when I hear mm -hmm. my name, Trudy, and I hear it with a resonance of childhood, um, makes me happy. That's beautiful. See, that's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's coming yeah. back to where you came from, really. And uh, yeah. Yeah, my mom obviously will have some. She has a little trouble. She doesn't voice it much, but I think um, she's not really eager to call you Krishna. No, and I told her she doesn't have to, and I told anyone right. they don't have to. But it's, it's interesting. My friends, some of my friends, will have issue with it, and it's sort of like it brings up this stuff in them. I'm like, what's it to you? You know, it's but um, to they some of them. There's there's these this resistance. Um, I don't know. Well, I wonder I why know. it's threatening to them in some way. That's so. Yeah, it, it it triggers something in them, and I try to say like, you know, look, if if it, it's just a, it's just a word, and uh, we're still friends, and you don't have to do it. But if you asked me to do this for you, I don't. Wh why wouldn't I do it for you? You know. I think people might feel that somehow when you take a new name, it means you were dissatisfied with who you were previously, or it. But you said it so beautifully that when someone uses the name. It's like the Dharma calling you. It it's reminds you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's why people wear white turbans and wear malas on their wrists or around their necks. Or all of those things are reminders for us because it's so easy to forget who we really are and what we're really doing here. Yes. I couldn't agree more. Now, in that vein, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, sure. What, what are the ways... So I know you founded Inside LA, or at least were one of the founders. Or was it was it your I'm, I'm the inception? Founder. I'm you are the founder. founder. All right, great. And I find this—I I haven't been there, but um, 
I know it has a lot to do with sort of meditation and mindfulness in a modern world. And, yes. you know, what are these, these things that you found we can do as sort of like the micro shocks or the ways of keeping sure. ourselves on our toes that aren't maybe something from a thousand years ago that might not have as much relevance, but are there any simple things that you do? I mean, it could be uh, a name or beads, or it could be an exercise, or it could be something totally different. Well, it's, it's interesting you would ask me about simple things to do, because I actually love very simple things and find myself quite satisfied with simple, tangible things. Um, and in terms of Inside LA, and and I said I'm the founder just because I have co-founded other things. Um, you fact, should be proud. I, yes. Yeah, no, I, I'm proud. Yeah. I'm proud of the things I co-founded, too, an institute to explore the um you know, the interface between psychotherapy and meditation in Boston and a school for severely dysregulated little children that became a therapeutic day school for kids all the way up through eighth grade. And, you know, I'm proud of all those things too. But Inside LA was founded uh, from the beginning. It's actually the first meditation center that was founded from the beginning with a focus on both Buddhist path teachings and uh, secular mindfulness. And I don't really like the word secular that much because it's root. It means not sacred. And I actually don't believe that there's anything that is not sacred when we bring loving awareness to it, whatever moment mm -hmm. it may be. It can be a sacred moment depending on the attention that we bring to it. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I knew that I wanted us to, I moved to LA uh, in midlife in a kind of crisis situation. I came there really not knowing anybody. And I thought, I want to be connected to the community, the wider community. And as a Buddhist, that marginalizes by definition. There's places like hospitals and universities and um, mental health clinics, places I would like to be able to teach where just mindfulness would be more accepted. And, and honestly, I did not foresee the huge wave of popularity that mindfulness would enjoy, you know, 17 years ago when I started Inside LA. I just right. knew that I didn't want to be only Buddhist. And the simple things that come from both Buddhist practice and mindfulness practice have to do with what Ramdas taught, his core teaching, be here now. Uh, whatever calls us back to the present moment, whatever allows us to step back into a little more receptivity so that we're receiving what we see here, taste, touch, smell, instead of, you know, approaching every moment with our agenda for what it, we want it to be or dread, or afraid it will be or all of that stuff. So the simple things really are about opening up our senses, sensory awareness, being present with what we see and hear and taste and touch. I think of mindfulness as a very sensuous practice mm, because mm -hmm. we're staying we're staying close to our felt experience. And that actually helps with everything because that hones our intuition, being in tune with our feelings. Um, it helps us stay connected to our own flow instead of always being pulled off our own track to attend to or please or, you know, take care of others. Um, it helps us find a balance between taking care of ourselves and being present for others. Uh, so it's really about very simply knowing what we're doing when we're doing it, knowing that when I'm walking, I'm walking. When I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. And I'm not thinking about where I'm going next. I'm really with you. And... Mm -hmm. I think things like that. So is the enjoyment of the sensation of that presence, is that, how do I put this? Uh, is that okay? Like, I don't want to make that a goal because I always think of <laughs> Zen as question. sort of saying like, no, man, don't hang on to anything. Like even the goodness, just let it go. It's, uh, but I kind of like that sensual attitude of presence. It's like, it's just the way, you wash the dishes, everything is becomes, the presence is enjoyable. It really is. It is enjoyable. And I do believe we're put here to be in our flow and enjoy being here and learn from it. I really believe that. And the question, is it okay, is such an interesting question. I think it, you know, it comes from 
the sort of, um, I don't know, Puritan heritage in our country. And it comes from, as you said, you know, the teachings about attachment and desire and these things are bad. It's only bad when we get stuck on it. Attachment in, uh, you know, in Buddhist psychology and philosophy just means where you get stuck. So let's say I'm liking this moment of talking to you. And I like it so much, East Forest, that when we hang up, I'm kind of devastated. And I'm just like, oh my God, it's over. How am I going to talk to him again? And when can we do another podcast? And this is, this is every saying? podcast. Yeah. So I understand completely. This is how it always goes. Yeah. But you see, yeah. if instead I'm with you when I'm with you, and then when we say goodbye, I'm with the next thing just as fully. So right. it's actually about the stream of experience that we call impermanence. And, you know, mm. this and this and this and this. Because one by one, each thing can be, you know, felt fully and enjoyed. The problem is when we like something, we stick on it. And sure. we don't yeah. want to let it go and go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, I see that with children all the time. They're playing and you have to stop them because it's supper time. It's time to come inside or whatever it is. They don't want to stop. I really understand that mind. I think we all do. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I mean... Or the other thing that could be quote unquote bad would be getting so stuck on an experience that we become, you know, dependent on it or addicted to it or obsessed with it. Uh, I mean, there's lots of pitfalls. The world is a really sticky place. Right. Well, Ram Dass, I often heard him talk about, and I felt like this theme was coming a lot in the album that we recorded, was this the idea of the witness. Yeah. So you're sort of, let's say, sitting on the seat of the soul and you're watching the show go by. And how is that the same or not the same as mindfulness? Or how is that, you know, what role does that play in just being present? And for me, I'm yeah, just sort of great, watching it, you know, as question. opposed to trying to change it. Yeah. 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 Um, the witness that sees that note that can watch is the awareness that Ramdas also calls loving awareness because he wants to infuse it with compassion and tenderness. And that's very wise because that witnessing awareness, that is mindful awareness, but it can de evolve with us humans. We can take anything and, you know, twist it. Um, it can devolve with us humans into mindfulness, or witnessing even can just it can devolve into like a self surveillance where I'm watching myself, but I'm actually judging myself too. It, and who's who's watching who? That's where he exactly, gets exactly. Well, yeah. the one that's watching and has criticisms, and that's usually an internalized voice of uh, you know our early caregivers uh, of whoever they may be. But. So the, the awareness that's infused with just a little bit of self-compassion or tenderness that Ram Dass calls loving awareness, uh, I see it as really synonymous with the kind of awareness that we're cultivating in uh, Zen practice, for sure. Uh, they talk about Zen mind is magnanimous, is one of the analogies that Uchiyama Roshi used that I love is the sacred like grandparents' mind grandparents being the ones who can, they've seen it all. They are not phased. They have equanimity and they love their grandchildren. They love them no matter what they do. They love them on the playground. They love them in prison. That mind. Hmm. So I, does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I mean, there's many ways I think this has been described like big mind, little mind, but that's fun thinking about it grandparents mind <laughs> being like... a grandparent i think about that because i see how different it is being a grandparent from being a parent when i was a parent mm. i was anxious about my daughter i would hope this and that and would this happen and would she be happy and i don't have that with my grandchildren it's really a free open um i can really do in ram Dass's language i can just see them as souls without any effort Right. Whereas sometimes it takes a little effort to see everybody else as a soul. That is to say, loving awareness itself, as opposed to the identifications that 
we all have ways we have of you know annoying each other and so forth it's 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 such a trip all the manifestations it takes as being souls and i i i like to do that too like if i look at a crowd of people it, it's one thing to do it with like one person that's sort of its own exercise but i look at i just look at this giant crowd i'm like wow all of these souls each one is the protagonist in their own story each one is living this their own epic incarnation from their perspective and there's just so many you know there's yeah. so many and yeah o- overwhelming i mean in a sense we it's good for us to be able to see like the stars and how it's just this unfathomable amount of galaxies and stars it's sort of a representation of all the forms of existence on this planet right in front of us or you go the other direction just these unexplainable unfathomable amounts of atoms and and cells in our own body or even our own gut biome it's just like we're almost meant it's meant it's like a uh, it's like a koan personified. It's like it's meant to break the gears of our mind because it's like you don't need – you're not going to be able to figure it out and you're not supposed to be able to figure it out. It's like – other. it's sort of telling us that the only path forward is the one not through mind or through some kind of feeling or heart space because there's no other way to move forward through this complexity. Yeah, well, you're really talking about the vastness, the mysteriousness and vastness of existence and – and Ramdas has said um, so many times that the whole movement of spiritual life is what you're talking about, that movement from the head that wants to figure everything out and wants to know into the heart, the heart plane of this existence where we can be free and it's all love and we can just be. And in the heart, um, you know, we're letting that sort of sticky spider web of self, of self-reference and self-comparison it's really hard to brush aside uh when we're in the heart we're kind of able that web is not sticking to us that's what i mean by being free so do you think that meditation or is it for you a technique of getting into the heart well i think meditation brings us into our hearts because if only (laughs) even if only it's because we get so fed up with spinning around in our heads uh because when we sit still and meditate, we're just not mixing our attention with other activities. And so, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Then, then the mind spinning and thinking and thinking, it becomes extremely um, unsatisfying. And we long for something different. And I think that creates a motivation to do that. What I was calling about stepping back um, you know, I can't claim, this This is a teaching from a 13th century Zen master, Dogen Zenji, and I love it because it's how I practice, which you asked me about. Uh, and he teaches um, something called the backward step, where you step back from your agendas for experience and allow experiences to come to you, and you practice just receiving them as they are, just noting and receiving them. And you know, that sounds maybe, I think all of these things maybe sound too simple, but <laughs> well, they are a way to address our patterns, which are so deep. Right. It, it's actually, you're sort, of, you're sort of saying in a better way what I was saying, like these, the, the simple is the only way through the impossibly complex, which is what it all is in a sense. Um, yeah. And to bring it down to something very um, sort of tangible, like, Right now, I'm working on writing, and I want, I never wanted to write a book. I was always happy with the teachings that I had contributed to the world in the way that I did that felt as significant as a book. I didn't need a book to be happy. But then my my friend George Mumford, after he wrote his book, he said to me, well, when are you going to write your book? And I said all that to him. I don't need a book. And there's a, now there's so many Dharma books, and we don't need another one. And he just looked at me, and he said, don't you want your grandkids to know what you stood for in this life? (laughs) Oh my God, I started to cry. So now I'm writing that book. My target audience is my grandkids when they grow up. (laughs) Do do you think that the female voice of meditation as a teacher um, differs or is there, is it? Both, both and yes and Mm -hmm. no. Um, 
the way that it's the same is we all deal with, you know, our patterns, our humanness, and the teachings apply to all of us in that way. I mean, for example, my pattern is it doesn't matter what I do. If I write the book, the book won't be good enough. I won't be proud of it. I'll compare it unfavorably to everybody else's book. And, you know, that's a pattern. And I know that about myself. So when that starts to come up, um, you know, I can just see it for what it is. Those are the teachings that are for all of us. Mm. I do think that for women, it's different in the sense that, um, for example, they have what are called the three poisons, these three greed, anger, ignorance, these uh, forces of desire, of hatred, of um, uh, ignoring or denying or suppressing reality. These forces are considered to be what disconnect us from experience and the same for everybody. But I would say for women, you could say something like, I think it would be more accurate, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. These are our poisons. Do you know what I'm saying? We have different issues. Oh, that makes and me feel of, like I, I must be a woman. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you are. I, I, these are but my some poisons. Of the no. <laughs> are directed toward young, arrogant men. You I'm know? just being playful. Yes. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in that perspective of how, how that could be unique and how that's needed. As you know, there are many male voices in these fields. I know. And, I was so happy because I was looking. Um, I, I obviously didn't listen to them all, but I looked at some of the folks who had been on your podcast, and I thought, mm-hmm. wow, I'm really glad that I'm going to be on on this podcast because Krishna has interviewed lots of wonderful Man. men. And, you know, it, I'm glad you said that because I actually make a point to try to get as much diversity on here as I can, and it can be tough. Yeah, um, I know. Partly because my ecosystem crosses with a lot of men, whether it's I interview a lot of musicians and then a lot of uh, – let's just call them thinkers. And a lot of musicians are male. Uh, and and when I go to some of these retreats and things, a lot of the guys are, are guys. And I'm always I like, know. where are the women I can talk to? And, and where are the people of color? Because I'm, I'm always looking for that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you brought me on. And I think, oh, you know, yes. as, as women, we're also, we are acutely aware of why most of the musicians are men and why most of the teachers are men. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, great story. I have a friend, Denise Kaufman, and she was in the very first, helped organize the very first all-girl rock and roll band in the 60s uh, called the Ace of Cups. And they played, um, you know, they played in front of Jefferson Airplane and Big Brother and, you know, all the great Mm -hmm. bands Mm -hmm. of the day. And all their brother bands went on and made albums and became famous. And they began to have babies. And that meant they uh, uh, got to. They weren't free to go tour and go do the things that you needed to do. Now, the great thing that that in itself is not a great story. That's a typical kind of story. But the great thing is that now, fifty years later, um, a rock and roll aficionado found some recordings of them from back in the day and got in touch with Denise and said you guys never got to make an album. You were so far ahead of your time. You were so fantastic. Wow. And he is, um, he's supporting their, they just, they've already made their first album. Uh, they're going to make more. Mm. And he, excuse me, Jack is peeking through the window and distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Cornfield, get out of here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they have this beautiful Ace of Cups album, and they're all grandmothers. They're like these white-haired rockers. It's so fun. That's amazing. Yes. She'd be a good person for you to talk to on your podcast, actually. If, did, if, well, I would love an introduction. Uh, yeah, mean, I'll introduce that's you That's right up my alley. But yeah, there... this is the kind of thing, you know, the same thing happened in spiritual circles, too. You know, I was a mom. I was a single mom for many years. Every vacation hmm. I had, I did meditation retreats. That's mm-hmm. all, you know, that was my thing. Whenever I had childcare and time away from work, because I also worked and supported us, uh, that's what I did. But think about if I had had a wife, how much I could have done. Oh, my God. It, well, it's so true. And it, and it makes me think that everything I have accomplished, I owe to privilege of some kind. Whether it's, well, I think it's true it's, for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But I mean, I'm a white 
white cisgender, you know, Jewish woman, I, I yeah. have huge privilege of my parents valuing education and staying together and my whiteness, mm-hmm. you know, all that. Mm-hmm. I know. And that's something that um, I think about a lot as I, I know the world doesn't need more white men on stage. Um, but I also just, I value, I just value stories and wisdom and of any kind, wherever it comes from. And I'm also trying to think about how to reach things like psychedelic experience to people of disadvantage, whether that's color or minorities, because these are areas that when you, when I'm at psychedelic conferences, it's, it's pretty white. I bet. I bet. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the cutting edge of a lot of these discussions. It's like, well, how can we help those? Because I think a lot of times we get into spiritual exploration when we have essentially spare time or or money or resources, right? It's a uh, it, sometimes um, at least it certainly gives well, you the ability to, tr- to to do things. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, in my case, I had to make it happen. I didn't really have any money or anything at that time, but. But I even had access to knowing it was a possibility and traveling in circles where people were doing that. And that's supportive too. I just want to come back to one thing you said about, you know, Please. being a white man and the world doesn't need that. And But I feel like we have to all pay attention to, to where the light is glowing, you know, in, uh, and if you have, in your music and your, that beautiful CD that you made with Ram Dass, I mean, that is shining all over. I have a yo- friend who's a yoga teacher up in the Pacific Northwest who plays that for her classes, you know? Oh, yeah. And yeah, thank you. So, yeah. So I just, you know, seeing where it's shining and making sure it gets out in the world is really important for all of us. Um, you just introduced the question of um, the psychedelics and accessibility in that realm. Yes, or the democratization of the experience. Um, I mean, I I walk in the circles of what's going on with the psychedelic revolution, both culturally and scientifically. And one of the edges of that is people being concerned that if there's a medicalization of it, it puts a high price tag on the experience. And they would rather sort of have more of a decriminalization, uh, legalization, where it's like, it's more about giving opportunity and education so that many people have the opportunity to experience it and maybe even bringing it to them. I agree with that. I do feel that, um, at least in the case in California with marijuana, medicalization was the first step toward legalization. Mm -hmm. And that may be the route that's most effective to make that happen. Um, but to have these experiences be accessible to everybody, including and especially communities that have been historically marginalized. Uh, this is something I also care about. And I talked about it in the retreat and you'll remember that, but I think whatever helps us know, what helps you, know, you the listeners know that you're at the helm of your ship and Mm. Um, and to realize how powerful you actually are just as you are. Whatever it is, meditation, psychedelics, psychotherapy, you know, <clears throat> however you f- we find a way um, to understand that and trust that more and more and more, that's the way to go. You know, all of these, I, you know, there's a synergy between all of these things, and none of them alone is as powerful as, integration of them you brought up psychotherapy and i know you have a background in that um do you believe that it is a valuable tool if the psychotherapist uh, um how do i put this like when i try to find someone to help me when i want to talk to somebody i actually ask them i'm like have you done psychedelics because i'm trying to just suss out or do you have a practice you know, like what their own development is and what kind of edges they felt in their own consciousness because I'm looking for a witness in a way and someone to spot things in my own thinking or being and I feel like they need a level of experience in a way. Yeah, I think that's one question that's powerful to ask because what you're really, you, you said it, what you're really asking is, are you an explorer? How far have you ventured into your own consciousness? Mm-hmm. Um, for a psychothera- psychotherapy is only as effective as 
the relationship between the psychotherapist and the person who comes. And, and, um, and I feel like as a healer, how you show up, it really depends on how you're supporting yourself. And by supporting yourself, I mean exploring your own edges, um, learning more and more about the various dimensions of the mind and heart that might go beyond what you learned in school and psychological theories of one kind or another. Um, I feel like the therapist has to be, be the lesson and live the lesson. You know, they do need to be practicing something themselves. Um, I don't, I think psychedelics is one way I used to ask if they had a meditation practice. Right. Um, you know, I mean, there's different, different ways to suss that out, but it is important. What's funny, it's like the, the psychotherapist being a form of a teacher. You know, they need to have a certain level of self knowledge beyond just exactly. what they've learned. And in that sense, I want to ask you, do you think we need a teacher in or, these days? Um, given uh, the level of information available to us, um, and do you think it's, it's required on the path? Or, yes, do you think it's, it's needed? Yeah. Um, first of all, as a therapist, yes, I do think that you do wind up being in a teacher role to some extent. And I want to just clarify something from what I said before. I don't think that the psychotherapist has to have ventured, say, as far as you have with whether it's psychedelics or meditation, to help you. Because uh -huh. why you're coming to therapy isn't usually because of difficulties when you're tripping or um, meditating. They're mm -hmm. usually relational difficulties. And mm -hmm. psychotherapists have hopefully, you know, trained a lot in understanding uh, the nuances uh, and origins of human suffering in that department. So I just want to clarify that. As for whether we need a teacher, uh, I consider a, having a teacher to be just a huge blessing. I don't know if it's required. I always had teachers. But of course, when I started practicing, there were literally two or three Dharma books. There was nothing. It's hard for you to imagine now. Yeah. You know, we needed a teacher. <laughs> the information was not out there. And there right. was no internet. No you internet. Know? Right. So we needed teachers. But there's still something today with all the information out there and all the podcasts and guided meditations and all this richness that's available. I, th I think there's something special about somebody knowing you, being known to someone. And there are things that arise in that context of being known by a teacher that you have to confront that you never do if you're always practicing on your own. For example, I remember um, the first and they did a personal retreat with Ram Dass, uh, I felt a certain amount of shame about some aspects of what was bothering me at that time. Mm. And one of Ram Dass's gifts is to dispel any of that because he always sympathizes. He's always been there. He's always been worse than you have. He's <laughs> always, you know, incredibly self-disclosing and honest about that, in, about his humanness. And then he looks at you, he, you know, you're gazed upon with eyes of love, even though you've just spilled your dirtiest secrets or whatever they might be, you know, um, whatever your worst thing that you don't like most about yourself might be. And that is so healing. You can have some of that experience with psychotherapy as well, depending on the capacity for love that your therapist has. Mm. But, um, I really do feel that having a teacher, having somebody know you, exp taking the risk to reveal and expose all of who you are and dealing with the gruesome paranoia that comes along with doing that is very liberating. And I assume to accept you in that moment, and like you're saying from Ramdas, you're getting that uh, that love at, yes. in the moment. That, that I mean, the, the witness... The way you can give your attention to someone through a loving witness really is the greatest gift you can give, in my opinion. I uh, agree. And that is something that you can have with a teacher in the simplest ways. Like, mm -hmm. I remember when I was practicing Zen um, in the 70s, and I met a monk who was a Soto Zen monk, and I loved him so much. And uh, we were having a meeting, 
and I felt compelled to confess my shortcomings for whatever reason, I guess to find out if he would still, you know, like me as a student. But I remember saying, you know, Coleman, I, I only sit half an hour a day. And he looked at me and he said, I wish I could sit half an hour a day. <laughs> and the whole meeting went like that. You know, it's just, he was just awesome. Right. Pull the rug out from every uh, confession <laughs> of my shortcomings. And yeah. really, you know, that kind of experience is hard to have online with um, an app. It's, it's just not possible. Well, I agree with you. Sometimes I ask these questions just to like play devil's advocate, but uh, there's nothing like human connection and face to face energy between yeah. people. It's sort of why, sort of why we're it's what we love because it's we've been doing it for for since the beginning. Uh, and I don't think you can. I mean, you can have that by Zoom or Skype. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's something that you have to necessarily be in each other's physical presence. Mm -hmm. I do feel there can be an energetic transmission through the internet as well. Um, you're frowning. Do you disagree? This is what I look like when I think really hard. See, I oh, can't okay. see you, so I'm listening very hard. So I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, okay. it's my Zen and Just understanding tell me if you look. want to see me, I'll put the video on. No, 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 it's fine. This is good. I'm a listener. I can listen. Sorry for the frown. No, uh, I understand. It's, 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 your, uh, it's your reflective, inquiring, thoughtful look. I had to learn the hard way when I was, oh, I don't know, my teens, early teens, I had a voice teacher and he was this, um, this very cranky gay man who is like the teacher in town, in my little town. And I apparently, when I was a kid, my way of listening was just total blankness on my face. I had not learned that you needed to give visual cues. Yes. And, and and we were in the lesson one day and he's telling me something and I was actually like scared of him and listening as intently as I could. So I was probably the right, most blank right. I could be. And he exploded at me just like, what is your problem? Like, do you, do you like, do you dislike this? Are you not listening? And I was like the complete opposite. I, 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 I couldn't be listening harder. And I had to realize that, oh, I'm, I need to give visual cues. I need to, uh, so I, frowning is probably not the best one, but, uh, this, that's my... <laughs> But serious it listening. It shows that you're taking it seriously, whatever yes. it is. Well, it is serious, yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to learn a little bit more, if it's okay, about Inside LA because uh, sure. Radha, my partner, has started a new meditation business as well, um, just one place here in Boise. And you have many of these, and you've been doing it for a little bit. And um, what have you found is people are the most hungry for? In, in like a place like Los Angeles when it comes to a brick and mortar to learn about meditation? You know, I found that out by, I just figured, well, what do I need? And when I moved to Los Angeles, I mentioned I didn't know anybody. I really, I, 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 I did it for family reasons. There's no other reason I would have done it. I didn't, I didn't have the things that are valued in LA, like youth and, you know, gorgeousness and money and connections. I didn't have any of that. Um, and I found that I was in my car a lot and I was lonely. And I right. thought, I need connection. I need a sense that I belong somewhere in this vast metropolis. And I figured because at that point I was already a meditation teacher and I knew from my own practice that what, what you experience in your practice, I mean, not the details, those are unique to each of us, but what you experience is basically what humans experience. So I thought, okay, if this is what I'm experiencing in LA, other people need a sense of belonging. Other people need a sense of community. And that's what I began with. I started, I, the whole first year of my sitting group, which is a meditation group, I started with two people, Krishna. I had two people in my group, wow. Fred, and, Fred and Steve. And then <laughs> gradually we expanded. But it was really, remember, I didn't know anybody. And I just started it. And I don't even remember how, Fred, how I met Fred and Steve. Um, <laughs> but I was known as a teacher elsewhere. That's what it was. So I got invited to teach a day long or something by somebody else. And then I met some people. They came to sit with me. But, but um, the whole first year, my entire teaching was about refuge and community, refuge and sangha, refuge and satsang, refuge. How do we be a refuge for each other? Why, why is this important? Why is this one of the three pillars of our practice and not just something extra? Why did the Buddha say Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha? 
he didn't mm. say hey, awareness and the teachings. And oh, by the way, yes, it was friends. It was all three spiritual friendship. These are equal, you know, you know value pillars. What are the, the three practice. again? It's he said Sangha, uh, it's Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But just Buddha, the way we can understand it, you don't have to be a Buddhist or even particularly revere the historical Buddha. Think of it as awareness, right. the loving yes. awareness, the, the Buddha energy, mm-hmm. the Buddha energy, mm-hmm. exactly. And the Dharma, it can have so many meanings, but think of it as basically the teachings of yes. how the mind works and how to drop into your heart and how to be free and um and then the sangha or satsang that's the community of each other that's your spiritual friendship and just like you were saying when someone calls you krishna it lights something up in you and it reminds you of something important like you know your spiritual life Mm -hmm. and presence that we need each other i really do believe we need each other none of us on our own we have trouble believing this is it but together we can reflect that to each other. This moment of our being together, you and me, this is it. This is really, this is it. Yes. I mean, can I go even bigger? And I hope yeah. this isn't too far out, but like, look, if it's, Please. if there's just all that is and all that is wants to experience itself, I presume it splinters into many infinite forms then I would suppose the whole point is to be reflected in all those forms is to, to witness all of it, each other, because that is it. There's, there's otherwise there wouldn't be all these different forms, like all these different people and animals and, and trees and, and air and rocks. And right. They're all discovering life in the form of what they are. Right. And, and that to me is one of the reasons we're here discover life in the form of Krishna life in the form of Trudy. And, when one person understands this and is is in the love of this, other people will join. They want to. They are longing for that sense of connection. I love you that. can call it to the divine, to the heart, to love. I don't think it matters what we call it. We have to call it something, of course. So people have a tradition and they call it something. But right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the words are anyway just symbols for anything, something else, and they go in and out of fashion based on their their baggage. And yeah. love's a yeah. pretty safe one. Um, yeah. So you're finding then with Inside LA in some ways what people were the most hungry for maybe was that sense of connection and community, Sangha, that sort of... That's with, how it started. and But they really sense. also they also wanted to learn how to work with their own minds and their own suffering. And that's mm-hmm. the most, you know, that's probably the most authentic reason to begin a spiritual practice is because we're hurting in some way or we're perplexed and we don't I mean I started I think out of massive confusion like what am I really supposed to be doing here yes Um, and you know psychedelics were definitely opened the door to this vaster awareness but I hated being kicked out of the Garden of Eden I hated coming down who doesn't yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I remember I told this story before that one of the times where I took LSD, I remember just walking. It was a full moon night. I was holding hands with my then boyfriend. And I, you know, I just felt, wait a minute. This is the perfection, utter perfection of everything. I could feel it of mm. that, that moment. And I thought, why do I have to be stoned to feel this this way? This is my birthright. So the psychedelics opened a door to what's possible, but the meditation and why people come to the meditation is they really want something more sustainable and something more workable in daily life. Of course, of course. I, I've i been talking this last year, it's been coming up for me, this idea of like uh, the engine of forgetting, like the notion that falling out and falling in. And so we, we often think about remembering or these sorts of words we use, like where we become mindful. And obviously in order for that to happen, you have to have forgotten. And then it's the idea of sort of honoring that, that the other side of the process, the forgetting. Yes. Um, that's beautiful. It's just as important. <laughs> that's beautiful. I love that because the forgetting does 
serve that function. You can't That's have one exactly, without the other, right? Yeah. This is exactly right. And in the Heart Sutra, which is kind of like the national anthem of Zen, um, there's a line, and it says, no ignorance and also no extinction of it. Say that again, no ignorance. No ignorance, that means no forgetting, but also no end to forgetting. Yeah. Right. It's almost but like getting is part of it. And I love this idea that you also kind of can't forget. You know, it's like there's no way to be lost, really, because there's no there's way to go. There's no way to forget yeah. permanently. <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. like there's no way to awaken and stay in that state permanently, at least not that any of the great masters I have known uh, have found. There's something about the, this dimension of consciousness we're in. Uh, like this operating system where like you're saying we we can't while you're incarnate this is these are the this is the playing field this is the board game and we're meant to always be in the yin yang that's the wheel that we're always everything's always is turning and changing and that's the way it's supposed to be it's sort yeah. of like what compassion do we bring to that how much grace do we bring to that how much love exactly yeah. and i think for you know, inside LA, I started something because I needed it and trusted that other people did too. And it has become really, I think, a light that we can bring of these teachings and, and the love that we share as a community. I mean, we've grown a lot, so it's not as personal right. that we all know each other anymore, but there is a vibe of the love that, um, that we share. And to bring that to this troubled world um, and let that shine in these times that really are seem to be dark in certain ways, although uh, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic. I'm actually optimistic about yes. the radiant hearts of human beings and what's possible. But um, for, for Rada, when she is starting her center, I think just to stay close to her feelings and trusting not just her strength and power, but, uh, her connection to the source of wisdom and being. And I think she'll get all the help and support she needs um, because her motivation, as mine was, is to help and support others and help them connect to their own strength, their own love, their own, including bring them to a place of their own self-love. You know, I think of myself as a healer more than a teacher, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, would it be too much to ask at the closing of this podcast, do you think you're in a space that you could guide us through a small meditation? A small meditation is what we have time for now. Yes, definitely. I would love so, that. Let's do that together. I'm glad you asked. Thank you. Yeah, it wouldn't have felt complete without practicing together something like this. So, so listeners, everybody just... Find a posture that you can be relaxed and still sitting up reasonably straight and just lowering your shoulders, doing a neck roll or two, and lowering your gaze so you're not looking out at things, but just letting the eyes rest and relax. You can close them if you want. It doesn't really matter. And then just tuning into the body sitting here, sitting still. And no matter how many thoughts may be dancing through the mind, it can always just very gently orient to this sense of the body being quiet. And that that movement in the mind is happening against a backdrop of stillness. You know, I like to rest my attention with the movement of the breath in the body. Some people like to focus on sound 
or sensations in the body. Whatever subject you focus, I mean you choose to focus on, just notice how there's an ebb and flow of the breath. of sounds appearing and then vanishing. Of sensations arising, being felt, passing away. And when the mind gets distracted, starts thinking about what's next or what was before, just shift the body back, just maybe an inch, ever so slightly, into a posture of receptivity. Just receiving the moment. No agenda. Allowing each thing to be just as it is. no matter what is happening. How pleasant or unpleasant or neither, it doesn't matter. We're sitting up straight in the midst of experience. in this great openness of heart and mind. Ding. I'm ringing the bell, not because we're finished, but because I have to go. <laughs> well, you've done that before. That was a good one, that meditation. Mm. I like that it's all against the backdrop of stillness. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for doing what you do. And I look forward to connecting again. Me too. I really enjoyed this, Krishna, a lot. Me too. I enjoyed meeting you guys. It's like, oh, kindred souls. I need to talk to them. Yeah. So. And thank you for the beautiful, beautiful music you are putting out into the world. Really very grateful for that. You're welcome. Well, enjoy your day. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you. Say hi to Jack. Sure thing. Okay. Bye. Bye. 
Well, thank you so much, Trudy, for joining us on the podcast. I really enjoyed having time to chat, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. I'll see you guys soon in the Australia, in the Oz. It's happening real, real soon. Thanks again. And uh, after that, we're working on seeing if we can get the East Forest Retreat in Utah in the fall, October 1st through 4th happening. Just trying to finalize some details. So hopefully we'll be able to announce that soon. We do have the retreat at Esalen, if that's up your alley, in Big Sur, California. Uh, Hot springs, natural hot springs, and a weekend workshop around how sound and music can be used as a tool for inner work. Uh, There's some other things coming up in the pike, so always check it out, eastforest.org slash tour, or just join the mailing list. That's a great way to know what's going on. This song that you're hearing in the background is called Afloat, and it's from the album Held, which was a piano record that I released, I think, in 20... uh, 2017 or something like that. It's one of my favorite records, and I'm in, in the piano mindset because uh, here in the, the Boise studio, and I've got two pianos. I've been working with this new Baldwin K 1923 grand piano, and I'm just starting to mic it up. And had a piano tech here the other day. Shout out to Jared. Just trying to get this old this old granny back into shape so we can record it. But I did an initial recording, and it sounded really nice. It had a really nice tone. So. Looking forward to sharing you the fruits of that that instrument. It's 97 years old, but some new parts. <laughs> All right, you guys, uh, keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit, but if you do, do it with grace. <laughs>